you know, I, I would say certainly migrations are always, every one of them is unique, you know, and every one of them comes with their own challenges. Uh, and, and, you know, just to start off, you know, I think that's a big selling feature for point for why do you want to get into a VNA? You know, let's, let's make this the last challenging uh, and difficult migration we have to go through. But to answer some of those questions directly, uh, certainly, I think one strength we see of our own VNA is its ability to translate and transform imaging data even through a migration, uh, and and having capabilities to to do it efficiently. Certainly, when you're moving large amounts of data, you know there's only so much you can there's only so much you can move, and, and often it could take a year or more to migrate your entire uh, your entire repository of data. Uh, but with that being said, if you have the right workflow capabilities in place, you know, your VNA should be able to look at the patients coming in in the coming days and weeks and prioritize how it migrates. So let's be smart about it. We know it's going to take a long time, but let's be smart about moving the patients and migrating the patients' data that is required first. If, if I, Eric Rice, am walking into a facility, let's bump Eric Rice's studies to the top of the migration list. So. So when you look at VNAs, let's make sure their VNA, their migration tools have those types of capabilities. Um, again, from a from a translation and transformation, you know, as you move that data out, I'm almost certain, as most traditional Pax vendors on the market today, don't update their DICOM image files, or they have some other proprietary format. You know, with patient updates and merges, you are most likely going to find that the data is dirty. Uh, so again, highlighting you know, with our own solution and as you're looking at other VNAs, you know, how easy is it for them to, to clean that data, you know, and, and resolve those exception cases. You know, in our case, as we move data out, you know, we can query different information systems and modality work list and things like that to make sure that the data coming out is in sync with what's in the information systems databases. So those files and that data is, is in sync with what's in the information system, and if it's not, have it updated. Uh, so there's different tools and techniques to do that. You know, I, I think you'll also find, <clears throat> as we do more and more migrations, you know, we learn more and more about the proprietary formats in these different vendors' archives. Uh, so some of, you know, we find some of the archives compress in diff different algorithms, or they wrap them in tar files, or, or or do different things like that. So there are, you know, as we go, even ourselves, we create new techniques and add it to our library. Uh, of, of capabilities that enable us to to go directly to storage devices to reverse some of those proprietary formats, um, but but at the same time I can't say there's one solution that can do it all. You know, it, you know, unfortunately there are some customers out there where, you know, it's going to be a discovery process for ourselves to see if we can do it more efficiently and reverse some of those proprietary formats out. Uh, and, and in some cases it may not be possible, unfortunately. But again, that goes back to the beginning. You know, let's try to get to those vendor neutral archives. So this is the last painful migration we have to do. Mock Seven does have API access to to be able to extract and also insert data in. You know, generally, generally from a, another PAX, there's this is where we get into the migration discussion of how you migrate the data in. Um, you know, when we talk about migrations, there's usually two forms. There's the traditional form where you're doing C finds and C, uh, C moves against the PACs. Uh, it's generally more resource intensive. It, it generally will affect a bit more of the performance of your PACs. Therefore, it's often throttled overnight, throttled up overnight to, to carry more load. Uh, but there's also uh, migration techniques that we have that we can go directly to the storage device uh, and not affect that PACs performance. So go directly to the storage device pull data directly off of that storage device and put it into the VNA. Um, you know, that is a more preferred approach, uh, and, and we can do that with most vendors. Uh, however, there are some vendors who, as we talked about before, have some proprietary formats that we can't go to the storage device for and therefore have to go in through the front end. But that's generally how we'll do that. You know, at Mach 7, we really focus on, you know, our, out of the box, by default, we, we generally always say, let's keep that, those non-DICOM images in their native formats. Uh, and, and this is a point of differentiation, I believe, too, with different VNA vendors out there. Um, you know, I think 
you know, in general, keeping that data in its native format is best. However, there could be instances, for instance, maybe you get an EKG strip out of cardiology where you want it to be wrapped in DICOM. So that can show up in the cardiology viewer, uh, in, in their DICOM viewer. So I believe there are, there are some instances where there's value in wrapping it, but, but by default, you know, I would, our opinion is you keep it in its native format. So with that being said, though, as you're looking at V&A vendors, um, you know, make sure they're not put into a proprietary format. You know, I think that's, that's kind of the, the past two decades that we're moving out of. That's what's caused a lot of our challenges. So let's keep it in, let's keep it in their native true formats with a few exceptions. There may be exceptions where it makes sense to wrap in DICOM. 